Guten Tag, I'm Josiah Schmidt. It's Monday, November 10th of 2014, and you're listening to episode number six of the German American Genealogist Podcast. Today's episode is going to be a bit different from the other episodes. The subject of this episode is interviewing your relatives, particularly your older relatives, about family history. I've written an entire book on the subject of how to prepare for and conduct family history interviews, and the book is entitled 2,000 Questions for Grandparents, Unlocking Your Family's Hidden History. The first part of the book is a guide to family history interviewing, while the second part of the book consists of a list of 2,000 probing questions that you can use in your interviews to help you get the full depth and richness of your relatives' memories. My book is now for sale through Amazon, Lulu Press, and Barnes & Noble, and you can download the e-version for the Kindle, Nook, or iPad. In order to give you an idea of what the book is about, I'm going to spend this episode of the podcast reading to you the first few chapters of the book, and hopefully this will give you some great ideas, suggestions, and motivation for conducting family history interviews as part of your genealogy research. Enjoy. Chapter 1. Don't Wait Your relatives' minds are a treasure box waiting to be opened. Did you know that your great-grandmother was actually adopted by her uncle? Were you aware that your dad was named after a former senator who helped your family financially? Had you ever heard the story about how your grandmother almost married your high school shop teacher but fell in love with your grandpa after he saved her little brother from drowning? You've never heard these stories, and you never will, unless you sit down and talk to your relatives. Fantastic stories like these won't necessarily pop out in five minutes of casual chatting, of course. The person you're talking to might not have even thought about these stories in decades. The vast majority of our memories lie submerged, deep beneath our consciousness. They are not truly forgotten. They are still there. They just need help being recalled. You undoubtedly have things about your family you don't understand. Mysteries you've never solved. Facts that don't add up. Ancestors you've never been able to find any information about. Rest assured, the answers are almost always out there, and they might be one conversation away. Your parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins may be collectively storing an entire hidden history of your family in their remarkable minds. You will need some assistance to unlock that history, and that is where this book comes in. The benefits of conducting family history interviews with your relatives do not apply just to you, the interviewer, and all of your genealogy-minded cousins. Talking to an older relative benefits the older relative, too, and that in itself is a good enough reason to interview them. As they march forward through time, their friends, neighbors, and siblings begin to slip away from this life one by one. As the world changes around them, they may feel more isolated and cut off. As their body ages and they don't have the energy they used to, it becomes increasingly difficult to get out of the house and see people. They may feel dull, burdensome, or, worst of all, forgotten. None of these things are true about them, of course. In their accumulated years, they have become more fascinating, important, and valuable than ever before. When younger people recognize the incredible value of an older person's wisdom, experience, and treasure trove of memories, it can boost an older person's self-esteem, sharpen their mental acuity, and even help to give them a renewed physical vitality. Older people are fun, interesting, and insightful friends with a sense of humor that never fades, 
and a perspective on life honed by decades of observation and living. They are an asset to our society in every way. When the oldest generation is appreciated, active, and healthy, our society thrives. Unfortunately, the oldest among us won't be around forever. This book is meant to help you talk to everyone, including your children and your youngest relatives. But when you are gathering together your family's oral history, the oldest must get first priority. They are generally the ones with whom you have the least amount of time remaining. Interviewing your relatives has many benefits. It will help you to better understand your elders. Understanding your elders means understanding decisions they've made, decisions which may have affected you. Understanding your elders means helping to prepare you for your own approaching rendezvous with old age. It helps you know what to expect in the coming years and decades. Understanding your elders means helping you to see their perspective on matters where you might not understand them or might not agree with them. Understanding your elders means helping you to understand why they are the way they are, perhaps why they've been able to keep a cheery attitude through even the worst trials, or why they get so discouraged in other circumstances. Interviewing also helps to form bonds with other relatives and to strengthen existing bonds. These relatives may be gone before you know it, and you don't want there to be any regrets about time lost or opportunities wasted. These people are with you here and now. That is an amazing blessing, and we often never see what a blessing that is until they're gone. Even if you've never had that close of a relationship with this person, there is always time to start or restart a relationship as long as they are still here with us. Seize the opportunity. As we age, we often look back on our younger selves and shake our heads at how foolish we were back then. How many times have you ever said, If only I knew then what I know now. Well, interviewing your older relatives can help jumpstart that process. Talking to these individuals can impart to you a wealth of wisdom ahead of your time. The lessons that these people have learned over the course of decades are completely accessible to you right here and now. All you have to do is stop and listen. Do you have an inkling of interest in history, what it was like way back when, and why people did the sorts of things they did back in the day? If you've bought this book, I assume you do have such an interest. Why not get the answer straight from the person who lived through that era? Interviewing older relatives gives us historical context to people's lives and gives us background to why they made the decisions they did. Did your grandpa refuse to ever talk about his dad? Did your grandma's brother disappear from the censuses when he was a young boy? Have you never been able to find out what country your ancestor immigrated from? Interviewing your older relatives can help solve family mysteries where document trails run dry. You could spend hundreds of dollars on a subscription to a genealogy website when the answer might be as close as a chat at the kitchen table with your great aunt Edna. When you go to the doctor and try to fill out a chart that asks you what diseases run in your family, have you ever sat there tapping the pen on the clipboard and making uneducated guesses? Knowing what your ancestors dealt with can have major medical ramifications. You may think all your ancestors were the picture of health and just died from old age, but a family history interview might reveal that every man in your paternal line has died from stomach cancer, or that heart disease is rife on your mother's side of the family. This information can help you make changes to your lifestyle that will keep you bouncing your great-grandchildren on your knee for years to come and will help you and your doctor know what symptoms to look out for. Of course, you are not the only one who benefits when your older relatives divulge their life stories and family histories. Your entire family, for centuries, and even with the advent of digitization, 
millennia to come will continue to benefit. Your children and grandchildren will have a family legacy preserved forever. How much of the story of humankind has simply been lost, swallowed by the darkness of history? We can put an end to that right here and now. It can begin with your family, and your descendants can be the first to benefit from and enjoy this legacy. Don't wait. The importance of starting this process earlier rather than later cannot be emphasized strongly enough. There are unique pieces of history, memories, that may only be held by one person. Like a flame that has been passed from torch to torch across many miles, a mere one person may be the sole keeper of an incredible fact or memory, and it is up to you to make sure that flame doesn't go out before it can be passed on. That memory may be fading away as age takes its toll on the individual's brain, or the memory may simply vanish when the individual departs this life. Our mortality is always encroaching, steadily moving forward. Our mortality is not always predictable, however. Anything can happen, and any particular person may be with us today and gone tomorrow. Never assume that anyone has a guaranteed amount of time left. When one person dies, an entire wealth of knowledge, wisdom, and history is gone forever. Many of the memories that an individual holds are memories that no one else has. Some of these memories are precious ones, that no amount of diligent research can ever retrieve once they're gone. The only way to preserve these memories is for us to ask the keepers to share them with us and for us to faithfully record them, store them, and share them with the world. Are you ready to begin? Chapter 2. How to Prepare for the Interview the first step to preparing for a family history interview is to decide what kind of conversation it will be. It can be a formal interview where you designate an hour of one-on-one -on -one FaceTime while taking notes and recording audio, or it can be an informal chat where you meet for lunch and reminisce about years gone by. Both formats have advantages and disadvantages. If you want to really dig out the deep and epic history of your family, you will need to arrange a formal sit-down interview. It takes time to tunnel down through the layers of niceties and small talk to get to the core of your family tree, to discover what makes your family tick, and to see what shapes it and binds it together. If your goal, however, is just to get some fun memories of Grandpa, then perhaps all you need to do is to plan to slip some questions in while you talk over a cup of coffee. Step 1. Arrange the setting. Whatever you decide, the next step will be the most vital one. Without this step, you will never learn anything about your family. That step is simply to ask the relative if you can talk to them. It is always polite to call ahead and make arrangements before dropping in on somebody and you will definitely want to make arrangements if you intend to conduct an in-depth interview. Call them or email them and ask them if you can get together and talk with them sometime. You will probably want to tell them that you'd like to pick their brain on family history so that they can get their mind warmed up ahead of time and drum up some good memories to share with you. You and the interviewee should decide on a date, a time, and a place for the talk, and you should make it a point to be there when you say you're going to be there. You and the interviewee will also need to agree on a setting. Typically, the best place to conduct the interview is in their home, as that is where they usually feel most at ease, and that is where they will be surrounded by all the sights, sounds, and smells that stimulate memories of all the years gone by. However, if the interviewee has a lot of activity going on at their home, Perhaps there is construction occurring on the house, or they have noisy children there. Or if for any reason the interviewee feels uncomfortable at their home, you may want to have the interview somewhere else, where the interviewee feels comfortable and there is little distraction. 
perhaps at a quiet favorite cafe of theirs or at your house. It also often helps if you are interviewing someone whom you are not exactly closely related to, maybe a step great aunt or an older cousin who is twice removed, if you also ask someone who they are close with to be present during the interview. If you don't have that strong of a rapport with the interviewee yet, then having one of the interviewee's children or one of their siblings at their side during the interview may help make them feel more at ease. Furthermore, if the interviewee draws a blank during the interview, their close family member or friend may help them along. For instance, if you ask the interviewee if they remember any of their next-door neighbors from their childhood and they say no, the person at their side who knows them well may interject, well, what about that story you've told about the neighbor lady who gave you the music box? This may prompt the interviewee to exclaim, oh yes, that's right and subsequently send them off on a rich and informative string of memories from their childhood. In fact, if you are not very well acquainted with this older relative whom you wish to interview, it may behoove you to arrange the interview through someone closer to them. Doing so may make the interviewee more inclined to accept your request to speak with them. For instance, you might want to introduce yourself to one of their children, Tell them that you are interviewing older relatives for a family history project and ask if you can interview their parent. The child will know the parent's schedule, will have an idea of how long of an interview the parent can handle, and will be able to introduce you to the parent in a way that starts you off with more rapport with the interviewee. What if the interviewee lives a thousand miles away? Perhaps a phone call would be the best format for the interview. The same principles apply in this case. Arrange the phone interview in advance. Make sure the interviewee can take the call at a time and place that is convenient and comfortable for them. And if you don't know the interviewee that well, consider involving another person who is closer to the interviewee and can help lend you some rapport with the interviewee. What about email? Email has the advantages of allowing the interviewee to answer the questions on their own time and not necessarily all at once, minimizing the chances of mishearing something or not catching an important piece of the story, and negating the need for you to write or type out a transcript of the interviewee's answers. You could just email the interviewee a questionnaire and have the interviewee reply with an email containing their answers. Conducting the interview via email, however, has the following disadvantages. The interviewee just answers the questions that you laid out in the questionnaire and you are prevented from asking new or different questions you might think of during the interview based on information that you don't learn until the interviewee starts talking. Receiving the answers in written form won't convey the full emotional depth of the interviewee's statements and some statements may be misinterpreted. Perhaps a humorous anecdote will be accidentally taken seriously, since humor and sarcasm often don't convey well in writing. Sending a typed list of dozens of questions may seem daunting to the interviewee, whereas asking those questions one at a time in a relaxed sit-down setting will seem less demanding. The interviewee may continually put off answering the email questionnaire because they're too busy, but if you lock them into a face-to-face -face interview in a designated time frame, you'll get the answers you seek right away. After you consider the interviewee's needs and your needs, and you decide on the format for the interview, you will need to decide exactly what you want to ask them. Step 2. Choose the questions. When deciding which questions to ask an interviewee, particularly an elderly interviewee, you will need to be cognizant of time limitations. You will not be able to ask every question in this book in the course of one interview. You will likely not even be able to ask every question in one section of this book in the course of a single interview. It may be helpful for you to decide on a theme for the interview. Perhaps this interview will focus on the interviewee's childhood, or on their military career, or on their memories of their grandparents. 
you can have multiple interviews, each centering on a different topic. Coming back to chat with the interviewee multiple times will help you establish a relationship with them that will make them feel more comfortable about opening up further in the future. If they are elderly, it may also be beneficial to them to make a new friend who comes by regularly to listen to their stories. You should prepare a list of questions before you come. Borrow as heavily as you want from the hundreds of suggested questions in this book, and feel free to add any further questions that you can come up with. Try to think of specific mysteries or blank spots in the family history that the interviewee might be able to solve. Whatever happened to great-great-grandpa Conrad's sister? Why did great-aunt Myrtle have a daughter with a different last name? etc. You can craft an interview path that leads to these questions. Don't be too strict about the list of questions you have put together, however. Use your question list as a loose guide to help you along. The best interviews will take on a life of their own and begin to proceed organically from topic to topic. If the conversation starts to run dry, you can go back to your prepared questions and use them to start pumping the memory well and getting the stories flowing again. Forcing the interviewee to stop talking about a subject or memory they are obviously passionate about in order to return to the subject that you want to talk about will only serve to cut off the interviewee's train of thought, confuse them, and make them clam up. Step 3. Find Memory Aids Something that will help both you and the interviewee is to find memory aids to assist the interview process. Memory aids will help you come up with questions that the interviewee can answer, and memory aids will help the interviewee access memories they had forgotten about. An example of a memory aid might include printing off a copy of a 1940 U.S. Census population schedule where the interviewee and their family appear. Perhaps seeing the names of the family's next-door neighbors on the census will rekindle all kinds of lost memories about life in that neighborhood. Perhaps there will be an uncle living with them in the census return, and the interviewee will suddenly remember why the uncle was living with them, and all the uncle's funny habits, and where the uncle moved to a few years later. Another example of a memory aid that you can bring to the interview might be an old photograph. Perhaps you have a picture from 1925 of a dozen unknown faces surrounding that of your great-grandmother. The interviewee may not have seen those faces in several decades, but they may be able to tell you exactly who they all are and how they are all related, and then proceed to tell you about the personalities and life stories of some of the people in the photograph that they knew the best. Memory aids can take on many forms. Something as simple as your grandfather's unique signature on a draft registration card, a street address from a city directory where the interviewee lived as a child, or a handmade doll that you found in the attic of your great-grandmother's house after she died, can open the floodgates of the interviewee's memory bank and lead you to a whole world of history and information. Step 4. Decide how to record the information. The next step in the interview preparation process is to decide how to faithfully record all this vital information. Human memory is notoriously error-prone, especially when one human mind is passing a memory on to another human mind. If you throw into the mix the sloppy handwriting of someone struggling to scrawl down every word that comes out of the interviewee's mouth, you have a recipe for distorted and incorrect stories or altogether missed memories. It will help you to have multiple forms of recording happening during the interview to ensure that you get all the information recorded and recorded faithfully. While you should always take notes in writing as the interview is happening, writing on a notepad is not the only form of recording you will want to utilize for your interview. You will also want something more faithful, such as an audio or a video recording. You will need to ask the interviewee's permission to record them before the interview begins, however. Preferably, you should get their permission to be recorded when you first ask them to take part in the interview. 
It might be seen as impolite to spring it on the interviewee just as you sit down to talk that you have a recorder and you want to use it. While future generations might love to have a video recording of grandma telling stories about her childhood, a potential downside of this is that a lot of people are camera shy. The interviewee might freeze up when they're being glared at by a big shiny lens next to a flashing red light. Then again, they might not. You will have to use your own best judgment based on what you know about this particular interviewee. An option besides video recording is audio recording. You can use an audio tape recorder to document the interview, or these days you can also buy a small digital audio recorder at very reasonable prices. Digital recorders have the advantage of storing the data in a more indestructible and more portable format. Whereas tapes might fail to record part or all of the interview, warp over time, or be lost or destroyed, if you record audio in digital format, it can be effortlessly copied and recopied. Moreover, once a digital file is uploaded onto the internet, either onto a personal website, or onto an Ancestry.com account, or onto an online data storage space like Dropbox.com or the Internet Archive, it becomes very unlikely to ever be totally lost. An audio recorder, while it may not capture the valuable images and facial expressions that a video recording can provide, will at least be less distracting than a video recorder during the interview while still providing an accurate record of the things that were said. Having some sort of recording of all the words actually uttered during the interview will not only give you something to compare the accuracy of your written notes against, it will also provide insurance. Taking both written notes and audio slash video recording will ensure that if the written notes are lost, you will still have the recording. Or if the recording is lost, you will still have the written notes. You will want to make completely sure that the recorder is fully powered, either with a full charge or with brand new batteries. You may even ask the interviewee's permission to keep the recorder plugged into a wall socket for the duration of the interview to ensure that it remains charged while you are conversing. You will also want to test the recorder before you go to the interview location to get a feel for how close the recorder needs to be to each person at normal speaking volume. Before you go to the interview location, while you're still at home, place the recorder a reasonable distance away from you and speak about as loudly as the interviewee is going to speak in normal conversation. You absolutely do not ever want to have to remind the interviewee to speak up for the recorder. That would be rude, embarrassing, and distracting. Make sure that the recorder is of good enough quality and tuned to the right settings to clearly pick up regular conversation at normal volume from several feet away. If you are interviewing a faraway relative over the phone, you should also consider recording the audio of the phone call. When recording phone calls, it's not just good manners to ask the interviewee's permission before starting to record, it's also the law. Depending on the laws of your state and your interviewee's state, it may be considered a form of illegal wiretapping to record their phone conversation without their permission. Recording your phone interview may be as simple as conducting your interview over speakerphone and placing an audio recorder near your speaker. If your interviewee is technologically savvy enough, you might request that both you and the interviewee record yourselves on audio, and then the interviewee can send you their recording and you can merge it with your recording to create the complete interview. If you conduct the interview over a smartphone, there are downloadable apps like Google Voice, which allow you to record phone conversations and then download the audio files onto your computer in MP3 format. You might also want to browse the internet for a conference call service like freeconferencecall.com. This website is one of several sites that will give you a phone number for both parties to call into, give you the option to record the call, 
and then after the call is finished, we'll allow you to download an MP3 recording of the phone conversation. Paramount in any of these options is testing. Whatever you choose to utilize, test it multiple times with different devices, cell phones, landlines, etc., to make sure that it works well and that you get a clear recording. Step 5. Prepare a thank you gift. You will build up rapport with the interviewee, make them more likely to agree to another interview, and make them likely to offer up a good word about you to other relatives you might also want to interview if you end the interview with a tangible thank you. The best way to do this is to come prepared with a little gift to give them at the end of the conversation. If they have sat politely with you for an hour with an audio or video recorder running, allowing you to pick away at some of their deepest and most emotional memories, it's the least you can do. The gift need be nothing extravagant. Perhaps some simple flowers, a framed copy of a rare family portrait that you discovered, or even just a nice card. In years gone by, small gifts like this, from guests to hosts, were more common. It's a practice that is part of a larger culture of politeness and thoughtfulness that is sadly waning in this day and age, but it is something that elderly individuals in particular will appreciate. Going a little above and beyond what is expected of you can only help you. Chapter 3. How to Conduct the Interview After you have made the preparations and arrangements for the interview, it will come time to actually conduct the interview. There are eight key points of advice to remember during the interview. 1. Make the interviewee comfortable. 2. Be a smart note-taker. 3. Be a good listener. 4. Ask the right questions. 5. Let the interviewee guide the conversation. 6. Use memory triggers. 7. Be sensitive to embarrassing questions. And 8. Be aware of the interviewee's fallibility. Point 1. Make the interviewee comfortable. As mentioned earlier, you will first want to make sure that the interviewee is comfortable by arranging an appropriate setting for the interview. The interviewee's home is usually the ideal setting because that is where they will be the most relaxed and surrounded by memories, but circumstances may make another place more ideal. Perhaps your home, or a quiet cafe, or a park. If you don't know the interviewee well personally, having a third person there who is closer to the interviewee will also help make the interviewee more comfortable. Make the interview a reasonable length. About one hour for each interview should be long enough to enable digging into some deep memories, but not long enough that the interviewee goes hoarse. You don't want to tire out the interviewee and make them feel like talking to you is going to become a chore. When journalists interview politicians, it's expected of the journalist to ask tough questions and hound politicians until they divulge the juiciest answers. Family history interviews are a different ballpark. Don't make the interviewee uncomfortable by asking questions that are too personal, and don't press them to talk about something they are clearly unwilling to discuss. Doing so will make the interviewee shut down, and instead of getting some of the answers you wanted, you'll get none. Pay attention to verbal cues and body language by the interviewee that tell you it's time to change the subject. Point 2. Be a smart note-taker. You will not be able to write down every single word that the interviewee utters verbatim. If you try doing that, you will find your handwriting becoming a chicken scrawl that will be illegible when you go back later to read what you've written. Rather, you will want to write down key words that can keep your mind tethered to the stories you've heard. You will want to use shorthand, sensible abbreviations, and focus more attention on writing down key information. The best words to write down when writing shorthand are the subject, verb, and object of a statement. For instance, if someone tells you that George then decided to move to the town of Dysart, you can simply write 
George move Dysart. The subject, verb, and object can be used as memory prompts. You would not be able to remember a whole story verbatim, but a handful of key words written down will prompt your brain to remember the rest and fill in the blanks with less important words like articles and prepositions. Thus, by compressing a story into shorthand, you capture the meaning of what the interviewee is saying and can unfold the story again later. The interviewee may tell a story about a soldier who comes home from World War I. He wants to surprise his parents, but a family friend witnesses him getting off at the train station. She phones home to his parents and tells them that their son is on the way home. When the son gets home, rather than surprising his parents, the whole family is gathered there on the front porch waving. When writing the story, you may only be able to write down something like, Charlie come home, WW1, want surprise, friend see and phone ahead, fam waving. When you are reviewing your notes after the interview, you will see all the memory prompts in that line, and you will be able to fill in the blanks, fleshing the whole story back out again. Point three, be a good listener. Being a good listener doesn't just mean being quiet while the interviewee is speaking and not interrupting. While those are good pieces of advice, being a good listener also entails actively showing the interviewee that you are indeed paying attention. When you're not glancing at your notepad to write your notes, make sure that you are making eye contact with the speaker. If your eyes wander around to your surroundings, the interviewee will get the impression that you've lost interest or are not paying attention, and this will make them less enthusiastic about talking to you. Don't fidget, sigh, massage your forehead, lean the side of your head against your fist, or do anything that makes it appear you're uninterested. You may, in fact, be thoughtfully considering what the interviewee is saying, but you will have to actively send them that message. Respond briefly and politely when the interviewee makes a point. Nod your head subtly and use sincere-sounding verbal affirmations like mm-hmm, yes, or wow. If the interviewee is telling about happy memories, smile while listening. If the interviewee is telling about a sad memory, let your face show that you empathize with them. If the interviewee tells a joke or a funny story, laugh at it. Use the ends of the interviewee's answers as a jumping point for further questioning. This not only allows you to dig deeper into a story, it also shows the interviewee that you were listening and thinking about what the interviewee was saying. If the interviewee tells you about how their mother was a prolific quilt maker, don't just brush the statement off and immediately move on to a different topic that you are eager to talk about. Ask them about how many quilts their mother left behind when she died, or ask them if they ever got to help their mother make quilts. You never know what kinds of amazing stories these follow-up questions might seg into. Point four, ask the right questions. The hundreds of interview questions contained in this book are intended to be a great resource for family historians talking to relatives. However, there are thousands more questions that can be asked which are not contained in this book. Many of the questions that need to be asked are very specific to certain individuals and circumstances. You will not want to robotically go down the list of this book's suggested questions one after the other. When you ask the interviewee how they celebrated Christmas, the interviewee may tell you, my grandfather and I would go out on December 18th and chop down a Christmas tree, and then we'd take it home and string it with garlands. Instead of looking down at the book and responding with, Uh-huh, now the next question is, how did you celebrate Thanksgiving? A better next question might be something like, What was the most fun Christmas tree trip that you and your grandpa ever went on? That particular question won't be in this book, of course, 
You might not know that the interviewee had a ritual of chopping down the Christmas tree with his grandfather until after you start the interview. You will also probably not want to ask every single question in each chapter of this book in the order that they are printed. A question in this book may be unrelated to the question printed immediately above it, and some of the questions may be inapplicable to the individual that you are interviewing. Some questions are only for people with children, or people who immigrated, or people who went to high school, etc. Use the suggested questions printed in this book as a loose guide. Feel free to cherry-pick individual questions from different chapters. Let this book's suggested questions inspire you to think of similar but slightly different questions, and add your own completely unique questions to put together your own interview. You will notice that many of the questions in this book have one or more smaller follow-up questions immediately after it. This is because getting a simple yes or no answer is not as interesting as finding out the how, why, what, who, when, and where of the story. Avoid only asking questions like, did you ever go fishing as a child? and leaving it at that. Follow it up with, where did you fish? and whom did you go fishing with? And tell me about the biggest fish you ever caught. If you already have a good hunch that they did go fishing as a child, save time by cutting out the did you fish question entirely and going straight for the where, with whom, and tell me more about questions. Let's say that you're dying to figure out where your great grand uncle was living at the enumeration of the 1940 U.S. Census because you can't find him anywhere in the census and it's driving you crazy. You might ask your grandmother point blank, where was your uncle living in 1940? Why can't I find him? She might be completely unable to think of where he was living in 1940. Do you even remember the exact dates that you yourself moved from each place to place throughout your life? Probably not. However, if you get into a discussion of your grandmother's memories of her uncle, she might mention in passing that her uncle took her and her family to a water park near his home to celebrate her 10th birthday. She might have been born in 1930, meaning that that celebration took place in 1940. The only water park in the area might have been located in a certain town. When you put these pieces together, you may realize that you have just solved the mystery of where your great-granduncle was living in 1940. Oftentimes, there is no direct path to the answer you seek, but the clues to the answer might be there nonetheless. Point 5. Let the interviewee guide the conversation. This point has been made briefly earlier in this book, but it needs to be driven home. The temptation may exist to dominate the interview and continually try steering it to topics that you want to talk about, but the interviewee's richest and most vivid memories may lie in other subject areas. Be open to talking about the interviewee's fondest memories and the topics that the interviewee is most passionate about. If the interview starts to veer away from your prepared list of questions, why not let it and see where it takes you? You can always return to your prepared list of questions if that tangent of conversation dries up. The interviewee may continually skip around between unrelated topics. Let them skip around. The interviewee may have recalled a rare memory for the first time in many years and feel the need to get it out before they lose it again. Let them get it out. To repeat something said earlier in this book, Forcing the interviewee to stop talking about a subject or memory they are obviously passionate about in order to return to the subject that you want to talk about will only serve to cut off the interviewee's train of thought, confuse them, and make them clam up. Point 6. Use memory triggers. The idea of using physical memory aids was discussed in the last chapter. Bringing an old document, a family heirloom, or a photograph to the interview can be a great way to trigger long-forgotten memories. It can help you put names to unknown faces or personalities to unfamiliar names. 
Physical memory aids can also help uncover entire stories and lines of questioning that you would have never even thought to ask about in the first place. Most of our memories are submerged deep beneath our consciousness and need some help being brought back out. You may ask someone what they did for fun when they were a child and they might draw a blank. However, if you pick at their brain from different angles, you might eventually bring the memory back. If they can't immediately remember what they did for fun as a child, try asking them who their childhood best friend was. What kind of clothing did their best friend wear? What was the worst fight they ever had with their best friend? Do they remember eating ice cream with their best friend? The interviewee might suddenly remember the taste of the strawberry ice cream they and their friend ate together on the summer day when they rounded up the neighborhood kids for a kickball tournament. Or the interviewee might think of the flannel jacket their friend always wore and find themselves able to still smell that tobacco scent on their friend's jacket because their friend's dad smoked cigars. The interviewee might imagine that tobacco smell and suddenly remember sitting with their friend and illustrating their own comic books when they were 11 years old. Little sensory experiences can be strongly associated with deep-seated memories, and experiencing a sound or smell or taste from a long time ago can bring back all the people, places, and things that went along with it. Hearkening back to specific sensory experiences can bring back whole slews of memories that the brain had tucked away and never accessed in decades. As long as it's not a particularly painful topic, and as long as the interviewee doesn't seem to be totally bored by it, Feel free to pick away at a question from different angles, because you may eventually hit a trigger that releases the floodgates of times past. Point 7. Be sensitive to embarrassing questions. Some of these suggested questions in this book are of a personal nature, and some of this book's questions ask the interviewee to reveal things that might reflect negatively on the interviewee. You will have to use your best discretion based on how sensitive the interviewee is and what you already know about the interviewee's past. Asking one person to tell how their parents fought may result in the interviewee laughing and spilling out a dozen funny stories. Asking another person how their parents fought may bring back very painful memories that the interviewee would rather avoid. Pay attention to the interviewee's body language as they're talking. A few signs that the interviewee is comfortable with the questioning include things like looking you in the eye, having their whole body facing you, having an open body stance, appearing still and at ease, and giving genuine smiles that employ all their cheek muscles and actually push up the corners of their eyes. A few signs that the interviewee is annoyed or not comfortable with the questioning include things like glancing off to the side, facing their body slightly away from you, covering or guarding themselves by crossing their arms or legs, fidgeting and employing self-touch gestures like wringing of the hands or scratching of the head, and giving fake smiles that look more like grimaces. Use your best sense to judge when it's okay to continue a line of questioning and to know when it's time to back off and change the subject. It is okay to let the interviewee know at the beginning of the interview that if they're uncomfortable with any question, they can just say, pass. It is also okay to preface a question with, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, or forgive me if this is too personal. But don't use that preface as an excuse to just ask any inappropriate question. Try to intersperse your negative questions amongst more positive questions. If you ask, when was the time you got in the worst trouble as a child, followed by, what was your hardest teenage relationship breakup, followed by, did you ever flunk any classes, all back to back, your interview may start to feel like an interrogation, and the interviewee may feel like you are judging them or writing a tabloid piece on them. This goes for overly personal questions, too. It may be acceptable to ask questions like, Who is your first kiss? And, 
what was the most serious relationship you had before you met your spouse? And what was the saddest memory of your life? But if you ask them all in a row, the interviewee may feel too vulnerable and start to clam up. Intersperse these questions amongst positive questions that are more likely to elicit happy or neutral responses. Intersperse these questions amongst positive questions that are more likely to elicit happy or neutral memories. When you ask a negative question like, Do you ever remember your grandpa getting really angry? Follow it or precede it with a positive question like, What is your fondest memory of your grandpa? This is also an important piece of advice to keep in mind when asking about previous generations. People typically have fond memories of the ancestors that they knew and met. Even if a person doesn't have particularly fond memories of an ancestor, they often feel a family loyalty to that person and will fiercely guard that ancestor's reputation. Tread carefully when asking potentially embarrassing or negative questions about a person's parents, grandparents, or other relatives. Just because the embarrassing or negative question isn't in regard to the interviewee personally, the interviewee might still take offense. Make sure that the interviewee feels that you are painting a positive portrait of their family and are honoring their family legacy, not trying to dig up skeletons or air the family's dirty laundry in public. As family historians, we always want to find the truth and dispel false myths, but we also have to take tact and respectfulness as important ingredients any time we deal with a person's legacy and loved ones. Point 8. Be aware of the interviewee's fallibility. To repeat the last sentence of the last section, as family historians, we always want to find the truth and dispel false myths but we also have to take tact and respectfulness as important ingredients any time we deal with a person's legacy and loved ones. You will find, as you interview relatives for family history purposes, that much of the oral history that's been passed down is false or distorted. The interviewee may tell you that their grandparents were born in Ohio, but later investigation may turn up the grandparents' birth certificates in Tennessee. The interviewee may tell you that their immigrant great-grandpa was a stowaway on a ship, but you might have already contacted an archive in the old country and found that the ancestor paid all of his emigration fees and is listed comfortably in the middle of the ship passenger list, indicating that the stowaway story is completely false. The human memory is notoriously fallible and even seemingly deviously deceptive. Sometimes the human brain creates memories that never had any basis in reality. When you interview a relative, take everything they say with a pinch of salt, and don't necessarily take every family legend as gospel truth. There may also come times when you know that what the interviewee is saying is false. Do you correct them or let it slide? Here you will have to use your best judgment. Some things may not be worth the possibility of embarrassing or offending the interviewee by contradicting them. If the interviewee says, I am descended from an Indian princess on my mother's side, and my mother always used to tell me that that's why I have such nice hair. It's not worth it to say, actually, I've done the research and there is no American Indian blood in the family. Your mother was wrong. Just let them pass down the oral history that they received and cheerfully express gratitude for telling the story to you. You don't have to believe everything they say, and there is virtually never a reason for you to assume that the interviewee is deliberately deceiving you rather than making an honest mistake. However, if the interviewee says, My great-aunt on my father's side married a man with the last name of Smith but you're pretty sure it was the interviewee's great-aunt on his mother's side, you might want to press the interviewee and make sure. Are you sure it wasn't your great-aunt on your mother's side who married the Smith? The interviewee might reply, Oh, yes, of course, that's right, how silly of me. In doing so, you may help avert errors in the interview transcript 
that could trip up family history researchers in your family decades or centuries in the future, and also help prevent that person from repeating the incorrect information to other family members. If ever you do decide to correct an incorrect statement by an interviewee mid-interview, do it gently, respectfully, and briefly. If the interviewee shows any signs of combativeness on the subject, just apologize and move on to the next subject. You can print the correct information later. It's not worth derailing the interview over. When it comes to ending the interview, it is better to do so a little early even if you have many more questions you would like to ask. This will help ensure that the interviewee is not exhausted at the end of the conversation. Furthermore, it also keeps in line with the old adage, leave them wanting more. If you wait until the conversation grinds to an awkward, boring halt as you run out of things to talk about, you will not be able to leave on a positive note. If you end the interview after a rousing, fruitful dialogue that both you and the interviewee enjoyed, both of you will be much more likely to agree on another interview. Going home, rereading the interviewee's answers, and mulling over the new information for several days or weeks may help you think of new questions or aspects of stories that you'd like to dig deeper into next time. Questions you might not have been able to think of at the time you were interviewing. As mentioned in the last chapter, it helps to bring along a small thank you gift to give to the interviewee for lending you their time and energy. Nothing extravagant, but it helps if the gift is meaningful and truly expresses your gratitude. As mentioned in the last chapter, just like during the interview, use good body language when you are finishing the meeting and departing. Compliment them on their hospitality and mental acuity. Give them a firm handshake or a genuine hug, and thank them sincerely and clearly. The key things to keep in mind when conducting an interview are to be thoughtful and respectful of the interviewee, to faithfully record everything the interviewee says, and to use your best creativity and ingenuity in the questioning process. If you would like to advertise on the German American Genealogist podcast, please click the Advertise With Us link in the podcast section on schmidtgen.com. Since we're such a young podcast, we have some really affordable prices if you would like an ad for your product or service to be featured in one of our episodes. Your advertisement will continue to pay dividends because these podcasts are archived and everyone who goes back to listen to an older episode will continue to hear your advertisement. Contact us today to get started. I really enjoy doing this podcast, but I also enjoy researching genealogy for other people. My professional genealogy research services are available for hire on an hourly commission basis. If you have a genealogical brick wall and you'd like to get some expert assistance, please contact me at my website www.schmidtgen.com. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the German American Genealogist Podcast. I'd love to hear your comments, suggestions, and questions, so please don't hesitate to email me through my website www.schmidtgen.com. If you have ideas for future episodes or want further information on something I mentioned in a previous episode, please contact me. I read all my emails and will try to respond as soon as I can. Take care, have a wunderbar week, and auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>